did last week on the show um, was we examined just because it was the 30th anniversary. <clears throat> we went back and 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 looked at January 1988, right? And a lot of people like that is, oh, I love it when you go, you know, and nightly for a month and we see what the schedule was like and travel and shows and everything. But a lot of other people like that we got into a discussion somewhat, and there's been several questions lately uh, that we've had people write in. Uh, some people, I think we put it up on the YouTube, our YouTube. We didn't plug the YouTube, corny YouTube. Go to jimcornette.com and hit the YouTube button. But the headline was, what part did Dusty Rhodes' booking play in the downfall of Jim Crockett promotions? Because we had fleshed that out a little bit. And I said that, you know, ultimately Jim Crockett had taken the the heat, the buck stops there, and that promo he did during, the I think, the Mid-Atlantic Memories uh, the documentary shoot. So Dusty, you know, may have had movie producer ideas. One time he said on the plane, he said, boys – we're flying back from some show and we did been 12,000 people, wherever the fuck it was. He said, boy, this time next year, we're going to be making major motion pictures and sitcoms. <laughs> and I swear to God, the next year that thing was the learning the rope fucking thing or whatever. They were actually making a fucking sitcom or in a sitcom, but he, he dreamed big, no pun intended. And, and wanted the best talent, wanted to be have the best, you know, the plane flying back and forth and everything. But ultimately, the guy running the business has to say, we can do this or not. And Crockett fell victim, which that was another question that we've fielded recently. Go to YouTube for that. Uh, Crockett was led to believe that he was going to make a lot of money when he bought all the territories, Kansas City, Florida, uh, UWF from the television syndication network, like Vince was doing up in New York, up in New York, they're making all that money on commercials. Um, and so he bought all those territories, assumed all those TV spots, some paid, some barter, but you've had to fill the fucking time, more TV tapings, et cetera, et cetera. And the syndicated revenue didn't come. Cause I think while Vince, as we've talked about, had a great infrastructure as far as an office in the big city, um, Crockett either dealt with the people that had been working for Crockett promotion for 30 years in Charlotte, or in some cases, listened to some of the wrong people. I think that he tried to catch up to Vince through, through these syndications and pay-per-views and such. So the TV revenue didn't come in. And also Vince, as we've also talked about recently, sabotaged Crockett on pay-per-view and no, if you carry this fucking Starcade business, you will not get WrestleMania. And kept it off uh, Starcade 87 off what? Did they have five cable systems? The Charlotte cable system carried it. So I got to record it. And then I found out after the fact. I, do, I don't even think we knew at the time that all of them were going to not carry us. But it was Meltzer's in San Jose because they gave their word and like four other fucking Charlotte and four other places, right? So anyway... Uh, so Crockett was sabotaged off pay-per-view and the bunkhouse stampede we had talked about in January 88. So all of a sudden now Crockett promotions is not on fine financial footing, partially because of these decisions and partially because the booking and the overall shows and the house shows and gates from late 87 through the early part of 88 had, had taken a turn for the, for the worse headed South, as they say. So would you is that a fair summation of where we were talking about before and where we ended up at? Yeah, I think so. I think that's where we were. So over the past week I started thinking about that. The it, it, it wasn't it wasn't anybody's one fault. It was a series of circumstances. Uh and Jim Crockett probably contributed as much as Vince McMahon and 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 Dusty may have had a fucking 15% penalty fucking percentage of of responsibility in there. Or whatever, but it's interesting to look at how everybody on those sides reacted once they knew that the business was not good. Even though it still kind of looked good on the outside, they had gone in the hole on money they'd committed and et cetera, et cetera. It looked like the crowds were still half ass there. Everybody reacted uh, in a, a different way, and it's it, and we can kind of pinpoint when. We knew we know that Crockett figured out that he was in trouble because of our mind in the Midnight Express's contract negotiations, as you said before we went on the air today. 
when we started talking because January and February uh, we weren't of 88 we weren't making any money as I'd mentioned last week and March was not looking to be any better and we were on contracts of a hundred thousand dollars per year minimum guarantee at that point but that had not been an issue because we had not we had always made well over that with Crockett but all of a sudden we we're making six seven grand a month and it's looking like it's headed downhill we didn't have anybody to work with uh, we, our programs were kind of floating after the new year. So somewhere around the middle or the end of March, we started negotiating with Crockett and he was convinced that even though the pay-per-view of attempts had been sabotaged, Turner Broadcasting was going to help him get on pay-per-view through Turner Home Entertainment. And they were still counting on this television revenue. Because when he started talking, he start, started talking about the syndicated revenue coming in from the vast network that they had, et cetera, and we were all going to make a lot more money than we thought. And over the period of a couple of meetings, he and I swear this is the way this went, and we got this on paper. I still I have this contract. I think I printed a page of it in the Midnight Scrapbook. He finally – we wouldn't mention a figure. And he wouldn't offer one. He just talked about the TV revenue. And we said, Jimmy, we got to have something on paper. And at the time, they were doing the balloon payments. So he could pay you along as, as the houses drew. But he had to pay you at the end of the contract the balance that he owed. So he was front-loading the things because of all his TV revenue. And so finally, I said, just to be a wise ass, I said, well, Jimmy, it sounds like from what you're saying, we could all make $250,000 apiece next year. He said, well, I can't remember. Ex I, I don't have the notes with me as to where our budget was, but I don't think you'd be too far off. And I looked at Stan and Bobby just blinked, right? And I looked at Stan and Stan <laughs> looked at me and said, well, why don't we come back, Jimmy, when you've got your notes with you? I swear to God, this is on my mother's grave. This is a re recreation of that conversation. Because And he was being so smug because he knew he was about to have a lot of money coming in and he was going to be, you know, running this fucking big talent roster and et cetera, et cetera. So we reconvened the following week when we were back in Charlotte after promos. And he said, well, I had you guys figured in at the level where you'd be making 200 grand a year apiece. And I swear to God, my first words out of my mouth were, Jimmy, well, fuck, we said 250 and you said 200. Why don't we just say 225 and call it even? And he said, okay, that was how hard it was to get that fight. And we signed the contract a week later. And all three of us, me and Bobby and Stan, walked out in Crockett's park, parking lot. It was a converted convenience store on Briar Bend Drive off of South Boulevard in Charlotte with Mercedes and Lincoln Town Cars in the fucking parking lot and Corvettes. And I, we looked at each other, and I said, I don't know if he'll ever pay us all this money. But at least we got something on paper with his signature on it, and it's notarized. And it ended up at the end of the – when he sold to Turner, he owed us sixty six grand on our balloon payments. Uh, and we settled for $0.40 cents on the dollar, which I have noted before. But that was twenty six grand, So he owed us forty grand, But still, we got that much extra out of him. And TBS started paying us on our contract amounts for, to do – less work than ever before as we'll get into so the point is that was april 15th we signed that contract and i've always wondered he may have either found out just right afterwards because they were negotiating i believe with tully and arn and he cut that off for new for new deals so he either found out right after he signed ours or maybe he found out a couple of days before maybe i've always underestimated jimmy and he's like fuck it i'll sign this i won't have to pay him but goddamn somebody might you know whatever the fuck i don't know but it was sometime around, you know, April-ish that Jimmy found out that they were a couple million dollars in the hole because of this money that was not coming and all these other things that had happened and the, the reduction in the house show business and et cetera. So at that point, business is going to get worse before it gets any better. Because obviously, the first thing Jim Crockett does is they have a great relationship with Turner Broadcasting, the number one show on the station. Um, they're already talking about helping, getting involved in, in uh, uh, the pay-per-view business. And, and because when they blocked Crockett, uh, that was the reason for the first Clash of Champions in March of 88, because TBS gave Crockett the free 
uh, over the air uh, free cable national broadcast of the Clash of Champions opposite WrestleMania that year because Vince was playing dirty with getting you know getting them off of the uh, Starcade in the Bunkhouse Stampede. And that started the the cable wars that we almost had. Remember between the uh, the cable companies and the wrestling promotions because they're mad. Then we, we each want each side to start costing the other side money. When, when was it? Finally, eighty nine. Eighty nine. It started in eighty. It started in eighty seven with the Starcade incident, and then of course Clash of the Champions one ran against WrestleMania four in eighty eight, and then of course the Royal Rumble. Actually, Vince fired back after Starcade. Debuted the Royal Rumble against yeah, the Bunkhouse yeah. Stampede. Then the yep. Clash of the Champions, finally Crockett fires back, and this time Turner is on his side and gives him that time spot, and it's a huge success. And then, of course, 89, they went Flair Steamboat against Savage Hogan WrestleMania. It, 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 from the Superdome, yeah. and George Scott wouldn't promote. Anyway, so the, the point is... And um, then the cable company said, cut this out. Actually, yeah, yeah, because you're costing us all money. Uh, but so uh, Crockett goes to Turner... Um, obviously as you know, can we get some kind of financial support? Who knows what the genesis was of the, the talks, uh, from what, you know, whether it's buy me outright or what the fuck can we do here? Uh, but dusty obviously had to do something because he's the booker and I'm sure he's, when he finds this out, he's like, okay, we got to put some money in the building. And the thing is, that's what people don't understand, especially a company that big and that had, had that many television shows spread out over the week. And, you you know, it, it, you, the fans were devoted, but you couldn't just turn it on a dime. You, you know, you, it, it took a few weeks for whatever you had taped to finally to air and somebody else to come in or some new angle to be shot or whatever. And also, if you just completely slop it out, and I'm speaking as a booker here. Uh, but if you just completely slop everything out at once, every change on a fucking plate, like goddamn goulash, you know, it looks like, as, as Gordon Ramsay would say, a fucking dog's dinner. You can't turn a company that size on a dime booking-wise, and if you try to, it looks so sloppy that it just fucking kills you dead at 4 o'clock anyway. So, wh- but you can see what he did, and... When I go back and I look at my 88 book, we talked about in January, we made $6,900, whatever the fuck. And I said, oh, Jesus Christ. By May and June, in May, we had one, two, three, four. We had five days off and made $4,975 that month. And in June, we had five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 days off, which is, I think is the most days we'd ever had off working for Crockett. And some of them, I can't remember why, we'll do that at another show, but some of them were because they were deliberately not running shows at the end of the month because the bash tour was coming up. And that was going to be like fucking nonstop, right, for 40 days, 45 days. But we made four grand in June. So so we're on this $225,000 a year contract, but we made less than $10,000 over those two months, which was a historic low for our payoffs. Because even though they found out in April, which, by the way, was a pretty good fucking month, actually, financially, we made 12 grand that month and didn't have a day off. Uh, Dusty said about going, OK, I it, 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 sort of like what I told Barnett that one time in that booking meeting. He said, well, how are we going to draw money next month? And I said, we ain't going to draw any money next month and we probably ain't going to draw the money, any money the month after. But if we start right now and figure out what to do, we'll probably draw some the month after that. But that wasn't what he wanted to hear. But that's, I think, what Dusty went into it going, we have a tour that's established, the Great American Bashes. And if I can assemble the best talent that I can get in the best way after we'd, they'd had some talent changes and turnover and et cetera, and I can hot shot this thing, which is exactly what it was, that's the meaning of the Great American Bashes. That's when you did hot shot because he obviously hadn't been hot shot for the past six months. He can hot shot this thing. He also knows that Turner Broadcasting is is now talking to, to people. So obviously he wants to be the booker. If a if a billionaire, old billionaire Ted, if he's going to be involved in this thing in any way, much less buy it, don't you think Dusty Rhodes wants to be the booker? Right. That's a fair assumption to make. Yeah. So. Dusty immediately says, I'm going to put the talent together in the right way. I'm going to make this bash tour huge, but I'm also going to have some fucking outs because they may not 
A, they may not buy the thing, and then we'd I'd book us into oblivion. And B, even if they do buy the thing, the business better not go right down or they'll can me. So he would not only setting up for the summertime, but he's also setting up the fall, and you can see it, right, in, in what he ended up doing in the fall. But in the meantime, that's the, the approach that I believe Dusty took. And you can, it bears out by in May and June, we made less than $5,000 a month. In July, we made $17,515 a piece. And of course, we worked all but two days. And, and, and in, in, into August, we followed that up, making almost 13 grand with 10 days off. And in September, we had uh, eight days off. Uh, more on that later. A uh, few of them were a paid vacation from the company and made nine grand and half the month that we'd lost our opponents, which we'll talk about here in a second. So you can see that he got business back at that point. And that's when a lot of the family members, Francis and David, uh, you know, thought, well, wait a minute, let's reconsider selling this because we got a good talent roster. If Turner, obviously they're not going to kick us off the station. If they'll be involved maybe in pay-per-view, but do we have to sell the company, blah, blah, blah. But they had determined, I think to be honest, it was it came down to did they want to risk their mothers and their retirements. I don't believe uh, they were hurting. but So that's when the sale was made. But once again, Dusty faced a different uh, challenge because he starts losing talent again because of the horseman deal which we'll talk about in a second. I know I keep saying this, but I'm just trying to give the overview. Uh, the, the horseman deal and, uh, and then the, the changes that they start making and finally, you know, uh, the clash with Flair. But at any rate, let's go back because we said some stuff about June or uh, about July 88 uh, last month in the, in the Great American Bash Tour. I teased some of the houses, right? That's what I'm, what I'm trying to say, boy. Trying to say. Okay, from horrible houses and not really focused booking, horrible houses and not really focused booking for the first six months of the year, we've pretty much established, except there was there was some bright spots, but business was down. Dusty's got to get people back in the buildings, and he starts the Great American Bash Tour in Orlando and does a record house of $83,000 at Civic Center. Not a bad fucking start, right? And as a matter of fact, I have Mark James's wonderful... Uh, Jim Crockett Promotions 1980 through 1988 record book, which has all the cards that pretty much ever happened. And uh, I'm flipping to that date now, but I want to recommend that for all the folks out there that love a bunch of results. Anyway. but this, Can I say <laughs> something? Can I jump in? Yes, yes. Yes, you may. I agree with your idea that Dusty, that the booking got better towards the end of the summer of 88. And look, if, if Arn and Tully hadn't left, and you're talking about Midnight versus Horseman into the fall and winter. I mean, that's amazing. That would have been great. So obviously things are on that path. But look, you can't, I can't overlook the biggest fucking mistake in terms of the booking, which obviously I think had an effect on 88 because nothing was done with it, was you bought the UWF and then yeah. you killed everyone. And I, I've talked about that before. And I, I guess I could see in hindsight, uh, and as my mother used to say, if a frog had wings, wouldn't bump his ass on the ground. Um, in hindsight, yes, they should have done more, but I almost think at that point, uh, Dusty was not necessarily happy that he might've been happy. They bought the, uh, TVs, but probably wasn't happy. They bought the territory because you had a bunch of towns that weren't drawn and a bunch of guys that had only been pretty much exposed on the television in those towns that he had to integrate all at the same time into his you know, roster at a time where he didn't think that business was going to start sucking. <laughs> you know, it's like the one thing people believe is that promotions hate each other. I mean, it's just, it would have been a natural thing to do. You had the talent there before some, you know, the Freebirds left pretty quickly. You, you started chasing yeah. talent off pretty quickly, but you had the talent there to really do something. And it was just a wasted opportunity. And it's not just Dusty, too, because obviously you go back and watch some of those TV shows. Eddie Gilbert will do a fired up interview and then Flair will come out there and just piss all over the UWF guy. Yeah. But that to me, well, when, when it, it comes it, to the end of 87 into early 88, that's like the big thing you have to look at. It's just, you know, forget about even the booking from Starcade 87. The UWF merger buyout was just completely squandered. But and also, once again, look who look who didn't even come with it. 
uh, DiBiase, because that, it, yeah. DiBiase at that point, Duggan is it just gone. It, 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 that's the problem is that those guys knew that we, well, we can't all just hop in here. It's like a fucking overcrowded lifeboat at that point, and nobody's going to get over, which is why every time something like that happens, unless they focus it on roster versus roster and only the top guys, nobody gets over. You can't just uh, throw that much talent out there. Uh, but those guys had already been contacted or had backup plans or whatever and decided, well, uh, there's already interest in me instead of somebody just bought my territory that I'm working in. So see ya. But anyway, I, I agree with you that, that could, but, but at that particular point in time, <clears throat> it was before everything went down. Now we're nine months later. Now we got to get everything back up. Right. So I just want to read the, the card because this is what he, he started with. Um, if the, I don't mean started with, but started the Great American Bash 88 tour with in Orlando. Uh, Larry Zbysko against Bugsy McGraw because they remember they still, I think, had Florida at that point. Or they still had the Florida guys. They'd already folded Florida. Yeah, the Florida title was still on Rick Steiner at that point. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, fine champion he was. Larry Zbysko over Bugsy McGraw. Ivan Koloff and the Russian Assassin who was... Uh, Dave Sheldon, the age, uh, angel of death or Jack victory. One or the other, probably, uh, probably Dave first. Anyway, Ivan Koloff and the Russian assassin beat J Ron and Jimmy Garvin. The rock and roll express beat the sheep herders. Fantastics beat the midnight express. Dr. Death, Steve Williams beat Kevin Sullivan DQ sting beat Mike Rotunda DQ. Al Perez beat Nikita Koloff in a Texas death match. And. Dusty Rhodes, Lex Luger, the Road Warriors, and Paul Ellering beat J.J. Dillon, Ric Flair, Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, and Barry Windham in what I believe was a war games, was it not? It may have been. Do you think any of that made up for the fans having to sit through Zabisco versus Bugsy McGraw? Uh, we can hope it was brief. I believe it was. But And see, and here's the thing. I, I think that there was probably six guys, you know, let's, four guys on that card that pretty much had jobs because their territory had got absorbed and dusty had a soft spot. Let's put it that way. Um, you, it, but it, it, the house would have been the same, but still the point is uh, it was a, a major card with major names. And, but that was what he had done to hot shot to get to get the people back into the buildings and back into uh, his programs so that he could continue from there. And he had actually told us, we had been working with Fantastics since uh, it was my idea to bring them in in March, and that's when Dusty let me do that uh, thing where we we put them over in the non-title match and we put them over on TV, and uh, d d that was my finishes and shit because he was letting me play a little bit, and he liked the it, we needed athletic opponents at that point. Uh, but then he had told me, "Kid, you're going to finish up on the Great American Bash. We're going to do the bunkhouses," and they beat me every night. <laughs> most of the time or 10 lashes to the loser and they'd slip over the boys. And then the final thing was they get to beat me up for all that we've done for them. But he deliberately didn't want to beat the midnight express most nights. Cause he said, I got some different shit I want y'all to do. So that means he obviously had thought about the thing with the horsemen. Um, after it makes sense after we have put over the fantastics and the blow off where really they beat me up most of the time. And, and the midnight are still, in in good shape. And then we go into a program with another heel team that has just recently had the shit kicked out of them in group matches by all the top baby faces, but still are the most over uh, other tag team in the company. And then he's also figured out that Ric Flair and Lex Luger is going to be his summer and his fall. And not only are they going to, they're going to do the disputed finish on pay-per-view at the great American bash to lead to rematches, which ended up drawing big houses, blah, blah, blah. So he already clearly has a plan because of the things that he came out with. And some of the people that after the bash 88 tour, he weeded off the cards as not necessarily being necessary to the fucking continued success. Of the company Al Perez or whatever. I'm sorry. Wow. I had Tourette's there. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so we, we went through, that's, that's what I can see as a booker trying to read his mind, what he's thinking of doing. Are you <laughs> okay with war games as an annual event? I mean, what did you think when they brought it back the second time in 87? And then did you just expect it would be a part of the bash going forward? Um, well, you mean an annual event in every town? I thought they did it a little too much, but I mean, let's, let's face it. He's hot shotting and that's what you do. So 
for once again, it still didn't hurt war games. They still had interest in it for years until everybody's completely, you know, fucked up after that. But, um, but he did what he had to do in 88 war games all around war games for everybody. He's buying fan shots. Come on in and see what the fuck I'm doing. You got to get them in there. So he, he dropped the cow on the bash tour with all the talent. And those were all stipulation matches. Like ours, like I said, ours were bunk houses, uh, with the three on two handicap where I'm wrestling or I get lashed or I'm in a straight jacket in the fucking cage or whatever. Right. But all those uh, matches were blow offs and title matches and et cetera. Uh, Greenville, South Carolina does $61,000 the day after we set the record in Orlando. Columbia, South Carolina, June 28th, $47,000, the record, uh, you know, when uh, business has been soft. Then we do a couple TVs, et cetera. But Norfolk, Virginia does one hundred and five grand. Charlotte, North Carolina, Memorial Stadium on July 2nd did $98,000, and that was a major disappointment because previous two years, three years, no, 85, 86, and 87, they'd done over 20,000 people and a couple of hundred grand. Uh, so that was a big disappointment. But then Amarillo does fifty grand, Dallas does almost fifty grand, Miami does sixty grand, Tampa forty five, a hundred and one grand in Raleigh, eighty grand in Pittsburgh, a hundred grand, almost ten thousand people in Chicago. Uh Baltimore, the pay per view, Great American Bash, uh drew a sellout, thirteen thousand people and paid two hundred and six thousand dollars. Uh, so obviously, and, and that let's go to that card because that's obviously of, of what he had for the plan for the summer. That was the, the big matches. That was the, the, obviously their chance to be on full paper. That was the first full pay-per-view, right, Brian? Yeah. The first full coverage pay-per-view. So yeah, that had to be the fucking show that he wanted to goddamn present more than any other. And it was as I vamp and turn the pages. Okay. Um, Rick Steiner and Dick Murdoch beat Tim Horner and Kendall Windham. Nikita Koloff and Sting drew Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard in 20 minutes. The Midnight Express beat the Fantastics via pinfall to win the NWA US tag title. That's when I was in a straight jacket and in the cage. That was the attraction that I couldn't intervene. Uh, but at the same time, he finally said, okay, kid, you had your program, but I got something else for you to do. He puts the belts back on the midnight express on the big show. And that means that the only time, the, the one that counts, the people saw the, the heels win and, and beat their, the baby faces and get their belts back. Uh, Jimmy and Ronnie Garvin, the road warriors and Steve Williams beat Kevin Sullivan, Mike Rotunda, Al Perez, Russian assassin, and Ivan Koloff in a tower of doom match. And that was Kevin's baby that he contributed to the summer. And that was the blow off with all the guys that had been involved in their program. Barry Windham beats dusty Rhodes. Uh, it just, he's obviously positioning Barry to be somebody that's going to be a fucking top heel, whether it be a champion or the challenger to the fucking babyface champion going forward because NWA world champion, Ric Flair beats Lex Luger via blood stoppage. And that's when oh, Lex, yeah. Lex was not experienced of uh, with or enamored of the blade. Right. So it was looked more like a pap smear as we used to say before you couldn't say things like that anymore. Uh, but <laughs> so it didn't get over, but it was supposed to be, he was supposed to be fucking juiced. Right. So, and there was a rule in Baltimore with the commission about blood at that point. They decided and they did the whole deal. It was trying to be a shoot if it'd been more blood, but at any rate, the point is he's, he, he knows he's coming out of the summertime with return matches for Luger versus flair. And probably eventually uh, uh, to p put the belt on fucking Luger potentially because he's already making Barry a top heel on the other side. So could that be his next champion? He's thinking out in the future. He has <clears throat> basically put the Road Warriors and Dr. Death and the Garvins over the heels in their blow off match. But all those guys are still strong. But there's plans for those baby faces. Um, Nikita and Sting drew Arn and Tully. They're neutral. And the Midnight Express beat the Fantastics and get the U.S. tag title back. So all of those people are going to be figured into what he wants to do for the fall to draw houses, right? So that's kind of where we're at. So we continue in July. Huntsville, Alabama does 31 grand. Louisville, Kentucky, $25,000. Because Jared was still running and we were in Broadbent Arena, which smelled like cow dung. 
And, uh, you know, the, the, the wrestling audience was taken. But Chattanooga did a record at the UTC Arena, $83,000. Richmond, Virginia did hundred and nine grand at the Coliseum, which is uh, pretty close to, in, in, at those prices, 9,000 some odd people. Greensboro, North Carolina does hundred grand. <laughs> there you can see another uh, example of in just Greensboro and Richmond are what well, I'm asking you fucking New York bastard. Um, <laughs> it's a three hour drive and they did over $200,000 for two shows within 150 miles or whatever of each other in the same part of the country with very similar lineups. Uh, Columbus, Georgia, 37 grand. Macon, Georgia did 61 grand. Cincinnati, 84 grand. St. Louis, 81 grand. Philadelphia on July 23rd did $147,000. So let's take a look at that fucking card. Yeah, hopefully the team of Kendall Windham and Tim Horner took the night off that night. <laughs> well, you ain't going to believe this. <laughs> yeah. Here's an example of when, when I say that they there is sometimes hot shotting can go too far. You load the card up like a 12 big matches, and, and there's a questionable cutoff of whether if there six people had not been on this card, would the fans have set the seats on fire? I said that to Kerry Silken one time. He was losing money on Ring of Honor live events. I said, list your bottom six people, and would the fans have set the seats on fire if those people were not on the card? Anyway... Ronnie Garvin beats the Italian Stallion. Larry Zabisco beat Bugsy McGraw. Rick Steiner beat Kendall Wyndham. The Rock and Roll Express beat Sheep Herders. Al Perez beat the Mighty Wilbur, Paul Jones' finest. Steve Williams and Jimmy Garvin beat Ivan Koloff and the Russian Assassin. The Fantastics beat the Midnight Express and Jim Cornette. A bunkhouse match. Sting beat Mike Rotunda by disqualification. And in the main event, Nikita, Luger, Dusty, and Road Warriors beat the Horsemen and JJ in the war games. Sounds like I'll be rolling up during intermission, and that's when I'll get to my well, seat. And, and basically, but see, once again, with that, that War Games was such a special attraction, it ate up a lot of talent, but it was so powerful because those both those groups me, meant something. For the past couple of years, they'd meant something together, and they had history intermingling with each other. So that was what drew your house, and then his featured talent was Sting, Rotunda, Midnight, Fantastics, Williams and Garvin, and and then and the rock and roll and the sheep herders. But I thought that's when I think he's mad at, at Ricky because Ricky wouldn't cut his hair at that point. But anyway, and the rest of the guys were the card uh, legitimately. He wanted Ricky to cut his hair. Uh, there was at one point he was going to have the sheep herders cut his hair, and I think Ricky. That's what started Ricky being on the outs with. Uh, and them deciding to go elsewhere at one point. But anyway, I digress. The point is $147,000. That was a price, pretty much a sellout uh, in the uh, Philadelphia Civic Center. So he got these crowds back. Roanoke was good. Johnson City was good. Fayetteville was $66,000. It had been 100 a couple years beforehand, but still. Savannah, Georgia, sixty grand almost. Jacksonville, Florida, 66000 uh, Daytona Beach, Houston, I don't have. Landover, Maryland, the Capitol Center, July 30th, $157,000 house. So 12,000-ish people in a place where Baltimore had just pretty much sold out. Detroit, Michigan did hundred and three dollars the, the, the card in Detroit, I will never forget, ladies and gentlemen. Detroit had not been a hotbed for Crockett Promotions. But basically, the the whole card pretty much that I just gave you, except the the rock and roll were gone at that point. It was Riggy Morton and Brad Armstrong, or Robert was hurt at that point, I think. Riggy Morton and Brad Armstrong against the Sheep Herders. But the same card I just gave you, basically, Fantastics Midnight, um, the Horsemen against the Baby Faces, but Dusty Rhodes and the Sheik against Kevin Sullivan and Dick Murdoch did $103,000, almost 10,000 people, because it was the first time back for the Sheik in, in the Kobo in like 10 years. And then he demanded they give him 10%, and they didn't give him the 10 grand, and he no-showed the next month. But anyway, um, he got, at the same time, as he was drawing these houses, and, and we'll continue, Milwaukee, 48 grand. Sioux City, Iowa did $32,000. Seattle, sell out 96 grand. Las Vegas, 48 grand. We talked about the forum in Los Angeles, 78 grand. They probably had to pay to get out of there. Oakland, which was not as fancy of a building, 98 grand. 
And that was the bash tour. <clears throat> and what he had done is he had hot shotted the fucking thing and got the people back in the buildings and hopefully gotten them interested in the, the product and the talent. And he put everybody over that needed to go over in all of their stories and scenarios. But at the same time, he kept his main roster, his, his team, as he used to say, uh, the people that he wanted to figure in going forward in the fall, he kept them strong in some way in all of those matches, right? Then, I mean, and, and once again, that's the, you could say, debate whether beating the horseman every night uh, until he did debate it kept him strong, but at least he had a booking plan. They were going into different angles with different people, right? And, but at the same time, the, the, the TBS talks had started and the, the potential of the sale had happened. And that's when about that time they interviewed the TBS people interviewed some of the top talent and apparently we were not invited. I think it was basically the horsemen and like guys like Luger and sting. We were not invited to be part of this conversation and maybe they already didn't like our contract anyway. <laughs> Since we had the, the new, we were at the time we were the supposedly being the, the highest paid guys in Crockett promotions besides flair Luger sting and the road warriors and Ellering. Um, but we were still getting payoffs from Jimmy so Tully, kind of as Dennis Corluzo, you say, put the mouth on Dusty's booking because there was the feeling, and everybody has, JJ mentioned this in my fine uh, Back to the Territories release on, on Crockett Promotions and Mid-Atlantic Wrestling. In 87 and before that, Dusty's uh, manner of booking, which was we're going to have the best workers in the business as our heels and we're going to be able to get heat on them easy and beat them constantly and still get heat on them and then have a bunch of charismatic but pretty much athletically limited or green uh, baby faces except for a guy like a Magnum or a Wyndham that, that you know, fucking are our hero, superheroes that the heels make – was naturally trying on the horsemen as a unit for trying to keep their heat and still be there in line for the triple fucking, you know, curly shuffle elbow or whatever. So often JJ would have to go to Jimmy Crockett and it'd be kind of the office conduit sometimes and go, look, you need to talk to flair. Cause they're afraid if we, if we take too much heat off of us, we're going to lose this thing. We all know if we can't, if you lose it, you can't get it back as easy. And so then Jimmy Crockett would kind of arrange a detente where he'd have Dusty and Flair both over to dinner or whatever, and everybody'd be happy, or he'd have Flair over without Dusty and make sure that Rick knew that he was considering their best interests and they were figured in. And, you know, so it was like the fucking mafia families having to sit down to keep the power balance. Well, now there's going to be a, a new millionaire involved a billionaire and the power balance broker is being uh, Jimmy Crockett is being edged out of the equation. And <clears throat> the point is, is that uh, there had been festering feelings that the, the horseman's heat was too easily expended and Dusty's thought had been, I'm sure, well, I can get away with it. And then when things went down, he turned around and got him back. So that was his viewpoint. But then he hears that Tully is sometime in the month of August, Tully has put the mouth on him to Turner Broadcasting saying that he didn't like Dusty's booking or whatever the fuck he said in the supposedly secret meeting that everybody apparently heard about pretty much instantly. And Dusty's response, as we know, Brian, is to ban Tully off of Crockett's private plane. <laughs> so he has to fly commercial to go to the shows. <laughs> Which... <laughs> which had happened before in certain circumstances when people acted inappropriately, but never just for heat with the booger. Just no, no plan for you. But I've, you know, and, and, but I can see Dusty's viewpoint too, but you know, everybody, but time is under the bridge at that point. But after the great American bashes, we have just set records in a number of markets, drawn great houses, proved that we have some appeal, most places in the country, but that there's still places that we need to stick to. And, and it's awful expensive to haul a goddamn whole wrestling show all the way to uh, the West Coast. We'd had 
like five days off after the bash tour was over with. I think the final date was on uh, August the uh, in Kemper Arena, August seventh, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, and I recommend the, I believe it was the Golden Ox outside the Kemper Arena as a steakhouse. But anyway, we get the rest of the week off and we come back on the following Friday, August 12th. And it was a syndicated uh, television taping for uh, the NWA Pro Show. This would aired on August 27th. This was August 12th. So two weeks in the, in the future. But I want to show you this card and I want to tell you what, what it drew. On August 12th, uh, th- it, there's partial results here, but the point is it was it was a two-hour TV taping, two weeks of, uh, of NWA syndication, right? But there were a couple of dark matches. Uh, so Mike Rotunda beat Kendall Windham. Brad Armstrong beat Al Perez by disqualification. Barry Windham beat Nikita Koloff. But the two main events were Lex Luger uh, over Ric Flair by disqualification for the NWA title and... The Midnight Express and Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson, no contest for the world tag title. Because we had just started doing at the previous TV, the fucking promos between me and JJ and then between Tully and Arn and the boys where, hey, we, you know, we deserve a fucking chance, blah, blah, blah. That whole do- deal. That Norfolk TV taping drew $98,000 on those two, basically those two dark matches, Flair and Luger and us underneath. And that was Dusty's plan as he starts, and we're going to skip ahead here a little bit, but we're going to start getting into some of the cards that he had, that he was obviously the direction he wanted to go for the next four weeks before shit went south. We had a few more days off that week since, uh, you know, the Bash Tour had pretty much run everybody ragged. And then we did uh, Raleigh on August 18th, and it was a sellout. Raleigh, North Carolina was a sellout the month after we had done a, a, a pretty much a sellout. It had higher prices for the Great American Bash, right? And on August 18th, that card was Lex Luger beat NWA world champion Ric Flair by disqualification. Road Warriors beat Rick Steiner and Mike Rotunda. The Varsity Club and Warriors were going to be figured in prominently. Arn Anderson, no contest, Stan Lane, and I can't remember... Why the fuck that would have been a single instead of a tag match, but nevertheless, it was positioned, as a matter of fact, second from the top, So, and we did a double DQ, and uh, Sting beat Al Perez and a couple of other matches. Uh, uh, Riggy Morton beat Barry Windham by disqualification. Fantastics beat the Sheep Herders. The following night in Richmond, same two top matches, Luger and Flair, Midnight and Tully, Plus, Dusty beats the Russian assassin. Dusty's getting a win to try to get established with where he wants to go. He's got Barry Windham over Steve Williams by count out. And the Road Warriors beat the Varsity Club. Sting beat Al Perez. $141,000. It sold out the Richmond Coliseum. The month after the bash that's supposed to be the big show did over $100,000. The return, The return of... Everybody wanted to see Luger win the belt, and, and at, the, at the time, people thought it could still take place in your arena. Imagine that. So the return of the finish obviously worked, even though everybody panned it creatively. The people were into it. They wanted to see Flair or Luger beat Flair for the title, and a completely new match between their two most over-tag teams of the last several years that they had never seen before and never knew they were going to get to see. And then once again, the, the, the Road Warriors is an attraction on the card with the Varsity Club, two guys that could hang with them physically, and Dusty and Wyndham being figured prominently in Sting. He's, he's setting things up. Philadelphia did $115,000 on August 20th, and that was with the Road Warriors over the midnight on top by disqualification, and uh, Dusty against the Russian assassin, Wyndham and Nikita, and a uh, Sting, Steve Williams, uh, basically Horseman multiple babyface heel match, but 115 grand after Philadelphia had done 147. Cincinnati did 52 grand. Uh, we did a sellout in Sumter, South Carolina, on August 23rd for the TV taping. So as you can see, he's content. And then we come back to Charlotte, North Carolina, on August 27th which was the first wrestling event in the new Coliseum that's since been torn down. The old Coliseum still there. 
there they had cheap general admission to get the people in a new building and drew one hundred and two thousand dollars with thirteen thousand five hundred people. And that was for Tully and Arn and the Midnight and Flair and Luger. Greensboro, for whatever reason, it was a TV taping. We were a dark match, was down to 43 grand. But the point is, he was continuing his business and he was setting these, these guys up. Even in September, Baltimore did $123,000. That was close to a sellout in the, uh, in the uh, Baltimore Civic Center. Detroit. The return uh, from the bash did seventy grand, and and uh, the, the payoffs were fantastic because those houses were. We were in basically the double main events, but then the problems start happening, and this is an example of what happens when you lose key people, and you have to take somebody else from something that you've planned for them to do to fucking fill in somewhere else, and it just starts a domino effect. On September 10th, in Philadelphia, we came back again. So remember, the houses were 147000 for the bash, 100 and something teen thousand I just called, and now back again the third time in less than three months, $72,000 still. And the card was Luger versus Flair, Dusty Rhodes and Kevin Sullivan in a dog collar match, uh, the Road Warriors in a get over match at Midnight and Tully and Arn and Sting and Wyndham and a few others. But those were the feature matches. And that was the night that we found out we were winning the belts because Tully and Arn had decided (laughs) when Tully got banned off the plane, his response was to make a phone call north and Arn probably figured that, uh, well, it, it, long story short, they went. We find out, so now the Midnight Express are the World Tag Team Champions and the U.S. Tag Team Champions. And our biggest money box office attraction drawing tag team that we've had since the rock and roll is gone. And, and, <clears throat> and now Dusty has no horsemen. And other things start changing. And now the worm has turned from he's, you can imagine. Meanwhile, Crockett had thought when the summertime, wow, business looks good. So they'll think that we kind of knew what the fuck we were doing. And and even though they buy us, they were going to keep Crockett in a consultant role. I'm sure he thought he'd probably have a little bit more say what he ended up having said. Uh, at the same time, Dusty thought, oh, I've got the fucking business back up, and now all of a sudden, plump, oh, shit starts happening. And within a couple weeks, uh, I even, by the way, filled in that week in September as a morning show co-host on WBCY Radio in Charlotte when the regular morning team was out of town. Uh, but anyway, um, by the end of the month, houses are counted down. Here, you know, Chicago only does sixty-six grand because now we've gone back with the Fantastics because they're the only team that we really had any history with and that he could plug in with us. And the whole thing with Tully and Arn is gone. And also uh, the horseman dynamic for any multiple person, big show matches is, is fucked. So in October, for example, hey Jim, can I stop you for a second? And ask a question. I, you, you better. I'm running out of wind. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. I thought of an anecdote that John Hitchcock told on the Super Podcast. Of course, John sat in front row section D in Greensboro, which was really the prime, the core town for Crockett Promotions. And he remembered one time where Flair went in the ring, and he, you know, recognized John from all those shows. And he walked over to that area of the ring, and he just said, "Where is everybody?" And, you know, John being, you know, a smart fan at the time said, well, it's Dusty's booking. And Flair just like kind of nodded and then walked off and went back into his strut. But I'm curious how much dissension there was between Flair and Dusty at that time. It seems like from everything I heard, their relationship almost had a complete breakdown because they had been so close. He had wanted well, to be Dusty's brother. So I'm curious what you saw, how much you think that affected things. And then also based on that. What comparisons do you think there are between the relationship between Flair and Dusty during that period of time and let's say maybe Lawler and Dundee behind the scenes? Oh, it was, it was, it's, it's, it's always the two biggest stars. I don't know if it was the Crusher and Billy Robinson, but, <laughs> but it's always, it's, it's always the, the two top guys that have tension, especially when both of them have either booked or designed, have designs on the book or both of them have been 
the heel or the baby face and feels comfortable in the other. So whatever the case may be, there's always going to be tension. One, one's a more of a workaholic. The other one feels like it comes natural to him. And it does. Um, there's always the, and, and, and those top guys are always contrasts. If you notice, there's never two guys that are any way similar to each other that are both top guys, in the same territory at any rate of uh, after obviously the horsemen have split up and flair from his, because we've looked at it from Crockett's viewpoint. Oh shit. Now there's a chink in fucking business and all this shit's starting to fall apart just for the sales going through. And Dusty's like, oh, fuck, I booked the fucking houses back and the people are here. And this has got as much interest as we've had in ages. And now this shit's fucking going on from flair. You can imagine. Oh, goddamn, The horsemen are fixed to be the goddamn, supposedly the main event fucking of heels in this goddamn company still for another big run and, and half of them are gone. So everybody's like, what the fuck at this point? And it, it, there's always, that's when dusty was obviously dusty figures. Now, well, the horsemen are trying to get out to get me. So he starts the, the idea to bury flair, right? Which remember, which culminates with, according to all the reports we've heard, the idea for Flair to drop the title to Rick Steiner at Starcade in pretty convincing fashion. Five and minutes Flair's, is what was always said. And, well, I don't think, I don't know if they ever called it that quick or not, but who knows. But um, but then, and Flair uh, being obviously the guy that Ted Turner bought the company for because last time he had time to watch wrestling when he wasn't fucking Jane Fonda from behind Doggy Style was, you know, Flair was the guy. He didn't know that Dusty, he didn't, I'm sure he didn't know what the fucking Booker was at that point. Although I'm sure Dusty would have loved to have told him at length. So uh, Flair had to be the key guy, but Dusty felt betrayed, et cetera, et cetera. So all this, so the point I'm making is we see, you can't just go back and look at a month. We're setting up for January, folks. We're going to get there in a minute. But you have to go back and look at the year and from different people's perspective. Would Crockett think that he was running a successful business and finding out I was there? I've, Sandy Scott was there, and I, I was personally was told by Sandy Scott, and I believed him, that at one point Jimmy Crockett walked into Dave Johnson, the accountant's office, which was catty corner from Sandy Scott's door, and came out 10 minutes later white as a ghost when he found out he was $2 million in a hole all at the same time. When they finally fucking caught up and realized what was going on and what money was coming and what wasn't. At any rate, you know, Jimmy goes from thinking everything's cool to, oh, shit, to it's coming back, but we can still get the sale to, oh, shit. Uh, everybody's going from up and down and up and down. And so are the houses. Because you go to October 15th in Philadelphia, right? So remember, we've done just boffo business in Philly for the past three months. This time it was supposed to have been, uh, well, I'll, I'll give you the card, basically the, the, the money drawing matches, Road Warriors against Steiner and Rotunda, Russian Assassins against Ivan and Nikita Koloff, Wyndham and Sting, Midnight Express versus Fantastics, J.J. Dillon versus Jim Cornette in a cage. We were the main event. It was not supposed to be that way. It was supposed to be. JJ versus Jim, yes, but Midnight versus Tully and Arn in a cage. But obviously, that that was that was the match that was booked. Because when I guess people don't even know this, in those days when you booked territory, the previous month on September 10th, when Dusty went in with that show and that card, the finishes that he gave were because he'd already booked the following month's card. Everybody knows that, right? Or is that just a lost art these days? I think people know that. So the point is the original finish was going to be us having a big fucking no contest schmoz like we've been having. So there wasn't going to be a definitive winner and come back in a cage match where the, you know, et cetera, and then put me in against JJ as a novelty underneath it. Right. Well, goddamn, we ended up being the main event because when he had to change the match and he had to do it, that since they were gone, you couldn't advertise that whole match for a month. So they had to uh, announce, no, it's going to be the Midnight of Fantastics. So we drew $52,000. <clears> and I would like to, and it was the, a great match with the Fantastics, but think about this. J.J. <laughs> Dillon and Jim Cornette on top. And the Midnight Express and the Fantastics in the semifinal, we still drew $52,000 in Philly in October. But it's also headed down the fucking Primrose Path. We've gone from 147 to 115, 72 to 52, right? So let's skip ahead. 
because uh, November 1st, the, the sale officially takes place, right? And we have just come off a pretty brutal run of Mid-South uh, towns like Little Rock and New Orleans and Jackson, Mississippi that didn't draw particularly well and end up <clears throat> in New Orleans on October 29th. Now, at that point, Dusty has said, okay, I've lost the horseman booking-wise, right? The tension's still going on with, with Flair and the horseman side. <clears throat> and um, obviously, Crockett is happy because the sale has – he knew it was going through at that point. It officially happened November 1st, but I think they signed the papers the week beforehand. Uh, but Dusty now is going to try to rebuild again, obviously, because he still wants to be the guy booking this fucking thing. So what is he going to do now that he's lost pieces of his puzzle? Um, in New Orleans on October 29th, the card was uh, the money matches were basically Kevin Sullivan versus Dusty Rhodes. Kevin won by disqualification. Steve Williams over Larry Zbysko. The Road Warriors over the Midnight Express for the NWA World Tag Title, and Lex Luger beats Ric Flair by disqualification for the World Title. Luger and Flair still had, you know, some legs, and <clears throat> I don't know whether when he may have tried to pull the trigger on that or at that point if they were going to, but he's obviously now got to establish a new heel force, and he figures it's going to be the Road Warriors. And so what he told us, that night was it 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 was scheduled to be a double turn like it was but really it was to get heat on the road warriors and just sympathy as it was to get sympathy on us just to get heat on the road warriors because i had already pitched just immediately when i went into damage control the previous month when we lost our goddamn golden goose opponents and pitched dusty the original midnight feud to bring in paulie dennis and randy because we needed opponents and the angle that we did on TV with him cracking me with the phone and the blah, 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 as everybody knew I'm not crowing, but was mine. And Dusty let me do it. He had me set it up with the guys and everything. But he knew that we were going to be doing that. And so he knew that we were going to be the baby faces anyway. So it he basically sacrificed us in terms of just getting our brains smashed in, all three of us pretty much, by the road warriors to turn them heel because he knew that we were about to do just what can the next week, as a matter of fact, in Atlanta, a couple of days later, we were going to do the angle with the original midnight where we would be turned full fledged baby face. <clears throat> this would get the road warriors as world champions so that they could feud with Luger and sting. It was going to be an, and dusty because Ellering was involved. So it was going to be that ultimate baby face and ultimate heel scenario. And then we were going to have a program with, the original Midnight, and then to be quite honest, as you can see from some of the other cards, as, as I've just read, it was going to be the the uh, Kevin Sullivan and the Varsity Club and, you know, probably a rotating cast of a few other baby faces to try to get the thing back off the ground again, right, at that point. Now, in New Orleans, we did thirty eight grand, which wasn't a bad house. And, uh, of course, they jumped us before the bell. They hurt Bobby, the beat-up stand. Bobby tags in, but the valiant comeback, but to no avail, boom, just smash, one, two, three. So that gets the Road Warriors in the right position. And we go the following week, and we do the, the Atlanta TV angle with the original Midnight. But at the same time, this year, Starcade was not going to be uh, on Thanksgiving this year, it was going to be at Christmas time because as Turner Broadcasting, for, they did, I don't remember what all the reasons given were, but the point is they didn't fucking want to run Thanksgiving and they didn't think people would buy the pay-per-view and they wanted to make it a Christmas show. Do you remember any specific input into why they fucked that up? No. Anyway, so we lose... Uh, as a matter of fact, Thanksgiving Day, instead of which I'd already written Starcade 88, because when I would get my 88 book or I'd get my next year's book, I'd write down Starcade, right? I scratch it out. On Thanksgiving Day of 1988, we did a television taping in, in the TBS studios, Techwood Drive. We weren't even at center stage yet. Instead of the biggest drawing gate of the goddamn year, we did a free TV taping. Where the fans, the fans didn't even have to pay to get in. All hundred of them. 
that's what with all of a sudden Dusty's trying to do the thing that he thinks he has to do talent wise, but there's, there's tension with him and flair and it's getting worse to where now he's thinking about, well, I'll get this fucking belt off this fucking guy and I'll get some of the leverage. Right. Meanwhile, flair's not going to roll over and play dead and he can actually appeal to Ted Turner. Meanwhile, as Dusty figures what else he does for the booking, he wants to get the road warriors as absolutely hot as he fucking can um, in, including doing the spike in the eye that eventually was one of the, the many, you know, uh, straws that broke the camel's back. But in the meantime, also Turner Broadcasting starts making some very questionable decisions. Of course, it's a TV company, so their emphasis is on TV tapings, and they would, and it would make the the TBS show look so much better when they went to center stage, and it was such a nice looking arena, and it, it just more energy. But doing constant TV tapings to satisfy all these masters was starting pretty much off the bat. And also, to be honest, in uh, November, they ran some questionable, besides these TV tapings, as I'm looking at it, some questionable fucking town locations that we weren't that strong in. But uh, I'll give you an example on November 18th and November 19th. Um, uh, Washington DC did 35 grand and the uh, Philadelphia show on November 19th. I didn't even record the house. It was a $400 payoff. So it was probably in the 30 something thousand dollar range. Things were starting to end. Stan Lane did, uh, uh, singles matches with Mike Rotunda and the Italian stallion <laughs> because I think Bobby was, was Bobby selling something. I don't know, but we had just been drubbed by the road warriors the previous couple of weeks to get that deal over and, and started the angle with the original midnight. But all of November is mostly uh, Charlotte Thanksgiving weekend does a $57,000 house. Greensboro is way down. The, 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 they, uh, they sent us out West when we finally heard about dusty uh, getting fired. We just started that West coast tour where it was our first house show run with the original midnights, which according to, the what Dusty had been trying to set up was going to be the, the number three from the top angle, uh, according to what he'd been doing. And all of a sudden, we're there and we're on the opening match, and they tell us go 20 minutes Broadway in Las Vegas and San Francisco and Albuquerque that weekend and Amarillo. In between that is when we had changed the finish, put the time in and then done a hot DQ because we were mad about our angle being squashed. And, and uh, JJ uh, uh, had disciplined us by telling us we had to go home unless we talked to Jimmy Crockett. <laughs> so then we called flair and then we found out dusty had got fired. And then we called Jimmy Crockett and then he said, please stay. And we stayed out there and all that stuff, but changes are being made already. Now dusty's no longer the booker. Uh, Jimmy Crockett is the interim booker, and even he told us himself, I'm not a, a booker. He said, I'm a, I'm a maintenance booker. I will keep this going, whatever we've got. And he didn't even do that uh, in, until we get a new booker. And then he promptly changed our angle. So all of a sudden, uh, he didn't like Randy Rose's work. So he's going to find Dennis Condry a new partner. So now by the time that I've, I've, I've cut my head with a razor blade 15 times on fucking and let Paul hit me with that jackhammer brick of a cell phone for, for an angle that's going 20 minutes Broadway in the opening match and is already being talked about as being changed. And that's just within a few weeks and December continued to suck except for the December 7th clash champion seasons beatings. We had the match with flair and Wyndham. Only time ever that we got to work with those guys in a tag match. <clears throat> and uh, and that did well in the ratings. But then Turner Broadcasting determined that they could cut costs. Do you remember the cost-cutting deal, what they did with the managers? They decided, well, to our live, because all of a sudden they didn't really care about the house show. Was that the Battle right? Royals where they put you guys all in Battle Royals? <clears throat> no, no, no. I think actually that Dusty did that uh, probably before. It was probably already penciled in and they kept it. And it was fun, too. We did a couple. But no, Turner Broadcasting by December had said, well, wait a minute. Why do we need to send all these people to the house shows? Because they didn't give a fuck about the house shows all of a sudden. So we, we have six managers. We can save six plane tickets if we don't send the managers because they don't wrestle, right? So automatically, 
the original midnight midnight angle is completely fucked because the angle was the managers pretty much be honest the varsity club kevin might wrestle sometimes but like jj he was in the office paul jones with his group uh that was that was you know maybe not a, a world beater but it sabotaged our angle but more importantly the house show started getting less and less love if you know what i'm saying they're just <clears throat> the matches might be formulaic or they might not run the most popular towns or they might run someplace because they oh i we know the building there especially when they got that idiot don glass that used to get coffee for ed cohen in the wwf so already they're starting to basically what i'm saying is de decry the importance of the house show which is your barometer and your indicator of all those those fans you got out there, right? Well, they wouldn't be pretty soon anyway. So they don't they don't fly us uh, with the matches in December to the like northeastern towns, but they'll still give us a little payoff. So they're paying us, <laughs> but they won't fly us there. Um, and and that uh, continues more in in January. So now I'll say this: by December twenty sixth, Starcade is the day after Christmas on a Monday. Still, still a hundred and fifty thousand dollar house, which even at those prices at that period of time it was gonna be ten thousand people in the Norfolk scope uh on a Monday night, and we found we had the big midnight versus original midnight uh, confrontation on pay-per-view and had a nice little match, but I believe it was underneath and and gosh, I don't I don't have the page in the book, but that was the uh uh Flair Luger blow off. And some other fucking things. That's when uh, Larry Matizik had turned down, God bless him, the offer to come and the insulting offer they made to come be the booker. And they were starting to talk to George Scott. <laughs> so, th- so basically, we, I will open the floor to questions in a second, but we have, from several people's viewpoint, established what had happened in the business the previous year to get us to January 1989. And shown what some of the towns did and what some of the trends were and what some of the people's reactions would be. Do you think we have brought people up suitably on where the fuck everybody was at this point in time? Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> do you think anybody, and I said this last week and people, oh, of course I was awake. All two of them said that. Do you think any, everybody's just zoned out by now? Because this is, is this too much over? Is this too much background as they would say? Or do, or do you think – because you have to look at this from a variety of, of options, do you not? You do. You have to evaluate the landscape. Well, there you go. So now we get to January 1989, finally. And for those of you who think it's going to be our first five-hour show, no, it's not because this is not going to take long because this is the punchline. When I started looking back last week at, well, we'll do January 89, I looked at January 89, and it sucks donkey dicks. <laughs> it's not worth <laughs> the show. So I gave you all this background to show how that the loss of key talent and the change of creative direction vis-a-vis the booker and and a, a a change in ownership all at the same time can destroy a wrestling company that obviously was drawing crowds of five figures on a regular occasion all across the country. And six months later, here's where we go. January first was the Omni as I, uh, the bunkhouse stampede, the manager stampede, me and Paul E and Humperdinck and Paul Jones and Gary Hart and J.J. Dillon, and I was the only baby face, so I had to go over, uh, and they about killed me. But it, there was almost 10,000 people there because they did the $5 general admission that they would usually do on New Year's Day, and that's a tradition. But then we go the next day, Columbus, Georgia, to a syndicated TV taping, and we do the bunkhouse tape, but it's $11,000. It's Columbus for a TV taping. The next day, Albany, Georgia, stampede and TV taping for more syndication. Then the next day, the 4th, Atlanta TV for air on the 14th. <laughs> and the next day, January 5th, Atlanta TV. The morning shows that would air on the 7th and the 14th. We're doing nothing but television. We go to Philadelphia, or we were supposed to on January 6th. Uh, but uh, the, our plane was canceled uh, from Charlotte. So me, JJ, Bobby, Stan didn't get there. Uh, Abdullah the, was off. He was stuck in Puerto Rico. Uh, Bam Bam Bigelow was off the card. They were starting to bring in a few different talents, but basically what what ended up happening in Philly was uh, Luger won the bunkhouse, 
and Flair pinned Steiner for the uh, world title, and the Road Warriors and Ellering beat Dusty, Luger, and Sting. Uh, but that house was apparently, because they had a snowstorm there, so that house was brutal, right? Like 3,000 people or whatever. But then in Baltimore the next day, the bunkhouse stampede, 63 grand. Then we go to the next day, January 8th, Fayetteville, North Carolina, in the afternoon, does six thousand dollars and greensboro that night uh i don't even have the house recorded but it was the bunkhouse stampede once again remember last year wasn't it a hundred thousand dollars twenty five hundred people flair versus the junkyard dog for the title (laughs) luger won the bunkhouse uh, we, I won the manager's battle Royal, but uh, all of us, just all these things happen at the same time. The interest has uh, evaporated, uh, January 9th, we go to Greenville, South Carolina. Now think about this for a second, Greenville, South Carolina, that's done a hundred grand in the past. They did 60 grand as you'll recall a few months ago, right? The match was me, Stan Lane and Bobby Eaton against the road warriors and Paul Ellering. Uh, that's the only, I don't even have the record of the rest of the crowd, but, or the rest of the card rather, but the house was $3,000. So, I mean, every, we weren't just the only match. There was a whole card around us, $3,000. And because the road warriors were supposed to be heels, but now maybe they're not heels anymore. They got to turn them back against the baby face midnight express that's supposed to be wrestling the original midnight express. We have no fucking it. it, it the booking just went South, right? Columbia, South Carolina for the bunkhouse stampede does 23 grand ba- then Bassett, Virginia, because now what they decided to do was they decided to de- sp- split the cards up into two tours since they had all these wrestlers and they would make big shows and then they'd have a small town show crew also. Well, we didn't care because if we were on a small town crew because we were making our contract money, but we knew they were sabotaging us because why take your guys that are making almost a quarter of a million dollars a piece and put them in Bassett, Virginia when you're running Seattle, right? Which is where they were. So they're in Seattle not doing any business and Portland not doing any business while we're in Bassett, Virginia and Harrisonburg, Virginia not doing any business. But the Midnight and Original Midnight drawn twelve grand in Harrisonburg was probably more profitable than the losing effort in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> so we're in Hillsville, Virginia, and Cherryville, Virginia, 11,000, 7,000. Then back for TV in Macon, Georgia, and Savannah, Georgia, and Atlanta TV. It's so four days of TV in a row, Monday through Thursday, from the 16th through the 19th. Then to Georgetown, South Carolina on the 20th, while the the big tour, um, hold on, I got to find it here. The big tour was in St. Louis at the Keel Auditorium, which didn't draw, which as I remember was of consternation to Jim Hurd, who had joined the company on January 3rd. Uh, And we're in Sumter, South Carolina. Now, at, at this point, Dennis is living in, uh, uh, Colorado, and he's starting not to fly back for a couple of these spot shows like in Elberton, Georgia, or whatever the fucking case. But listen to the cards and listen to the difference. On, a, on a, For example, in St. Louis, Missouri, on January 20th, what didn't draw? Ric Flair versus the Junkyard Dog NWA title. Luger and Sting versus NWA tag champions, the Heel Road Warriors. Barry Windham versus Eddie Gilbert for the U.S. title. Steve Williams and Mike Rotunda versus Rick Steiner and Dick Murdoch and Abdullah the Butcher against Steve Casey and Michael Hayes against the Cruel Connection. That was in St. Louis. So all of a sudden, they're bringing in new talent. They're running off other talent. They're splitting the talent up. They're running ill-advised towns. And, uh, for example, on January 21st, while we were in Sumter, South Carolina, they were in Kansas City. And did what I think may be one of the bigger houses of the uh, month, 4,600 people. But at the same time, they go to St. Petersburg the following day and draw 2,000. So anyway, we finish up the month. We're in Kenansville, North Carolina, Washington, North Carolina at these small spot shows. Uh, They they run um, Charleston at the Civic Center, West Virginia, and draw 2,500 people. Richmond drew 3,000 people. We're, on January 28th, Richmond, Virginia drew 3,000 people in the same building where we had just sold out in September. In four months, 
And we were actually on that show with the original Midnight and Midnight. That's one of the only original Midnight and Midnight matches where we actually both of it, because we both drove, me and Paul Lee, to get there. Because they still weren't flying the managers to a lot of these places. Uh, which they ended up starting to do in February after they'd already killed us off. But at any rate, um, Richmond, $36,000. $36,000. Norfolk, the night before, Norfolk, Virginia. Remember the scope, the the Starcade? It did $150,000 the month before? Yeah. 12 grand. 12 grand, pal. They just didn't want to see this shit anymore. And so then, basically, we we finished up... uh, the month we're doing another couple of TV tapings in Chattanooga and Marietta and the house show business plummeted from there because there's where they brought in right at this time. George Scott came in right at the end of the month. Um, the only the good thing he did was bring steamboat back, obviously, but uh, it, it just, it just fell in a hole and, and they couldn't find their wig and they couldn't grab it. And they couldn't promote the towns, right? They couldn't book the towns on the right schedules. The people didn't care suddenly about the talent. They'd seen too many changes and things they didn't understand. It was too abrupt. They pulled out of their core markets, even though, but the core markets wouldn't draw anymore when they tried to run them because they had previously abused them. And, and then they'd taken Starcade away and they'd fucked with that. It was just, it was, too much change too quick and ill-advised people on all parts doing it. And that's how you dismantle a fairly hot fucking wrestling promotion in six easy months. Now you see why I didn't want to do a whole show on just on January. (laughs) (laughs) The whole reason that we did the show was what happened the year before that to get to that miserable of a January. And and they never recovered. I mean, not in the until the modern era. They didn't recover under Heard for three years. They didn't recover it for from night from October November nineteen eighty eight, and they first started making a profit in what ninety seven. Nine years. Yeah. Because then they sh- started showing life in ninety six when they got Hogan and etc. But they still weren't making any money because they were they were so far in the hole. Well, no, I think the timeline maybe because Hogan went there in ninety four. Ninety six is the NWO. I think maybe it was a little bit earlier. Well, well, actually, they started. I should have said they started with ninety with ninety six with the NWO because they didn't start making any money when Hogan got there. They just started losing uh, money to different people. One of them being Hulk Hogan. Remember, he wasn't an automatic profit maker. Remember, they were they cost him money when they sold his T shirts. But the Hogan deal was unique because it was really the turning point in a relationship where all of a sudden Turner paid for Hogan's contract. It didn't come out of WCW's budget. And then that's right around the time also that was the situation that Turner Home Entertainment kept all of the pay-per-view money up until that point. It didn't actually go to WCW. It went to Turner Home Entertainment. I Don't quote me on that specific thing, but the gist of it was that WCW did not get credit for all the ancillary revenue that it brought in to, uh, in terms of uh, the television programming that they right. didn't have to pay any rights fee whatsoever, uh, whether it be pay-per-view income past paying the talent and et cetera, or whatever the, fu- you know, but we're, the more stuff went on the Turner books that the wrestling company directly was responsible for until later on when Bischoff got in good with them. And then they started getting all that stuff. But yeah, but yeah, I mean, but it just, it, that was how quick things fell. And the, even though eight, people remember 89 as a great year and for those major shows and for match quality, definitely with Flair and Steamboat and Flair and Funk, but it, it was, it, as we've covered in the past, when Flair took the book, we had a brief resurgence from around September, October of 89 to early 90 in terms of the TV ratings and in terms of the big show attendance, but the house show business was still shitty and Flair's tenure as Booker with myself and Kevin uh, was the most successful they had of, of any type for the first three fucking years. So the house show business never really did recover until the mid nineties. Like I said, Flair got TV ratings and pay-per-view buy rates and the big show houses back up a bit. And then they fell further in the hole through 91 and 92. And they struggled until, you know, finally it just, the they stopped, they stopped doing house shows. They stopped doing Well, as a matter of fact, I was out drawing Smoky Mountain Wrestling in 93 and, and in 94, my Knoxville shows were out drawing some of the shows they ran in the Omni in Atlanta. So, 
Yeah, so they stopped that for a while, and then finally they, you know, Bischoff talked them into spending some money. They got Hogan. They got the, and then the key was the NWO, the invasion angle done right, or done as as close as you can legally do to right. So, thank you, Jim Hurd and TBS for milking us for six fucking years. So when you gave us even something half as good, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> Well, there you have it. But if anybody wants to know how to tear down a fucking wrestling promotion, we've given them a pretty good idea today in this special extended episode. 